and thank you all for coming to the talk. It's a little bit of an unusual talk. Uh, it's not purely about physics, uh, so, um, but it's something I need to say, and so I'm grateful for the opportunity to do so. So um, as my abstract says, let's see if this works. There has been recent controversy on the whether room temperature superconductivity is real or not, as described in this article. And um, so I will talk about that. But uh, more specifically, so this was reported in 2020 in Nature. And uh, as I say in the abstract, I have had trouble getting papers published on this. And so there has been some controversy about that. And there was a recent article in Science News about the issue of uh, removing inflammatory papers and the fact that I have been banned from posting papers in archive, which I think is very unfair. So I would really like to discuss this. And anyway, so we'll get back to this. Um, and in particular, uh, uh, these comments I quote about what is the origin of this and what are the issues. And of course, I would really like to have a discussion after the talk, hopefully, for as long as people are interested in discussing. So let me just start in a nutshell what uh, I'm really bothered by, that I wrote several papers that I thought were good scientific analysis of facts, disconnect and incompatibility of data with other data. And they were all put on hold by archive and then put in the trash can and disappeared because, well, we'll see. So I've worked for over a year on trying to get the raw data underlying a claim to room temperature superconductivity. And finally, in December, 2021, those raw data were released. Archive blocked me from posting analysis of the data and then banned me from posting anything on archive and journals also refused to publish papers on this. And I'd like to talk about this at some length. So, uh, so here's just an example of a journal. Um, recently, what the journal said that the manuscript had been evaluated and um, it can be considered a standard scientific article according to accepted scientific method rather an investigation on potential scientific misconduct, which is subject for social and legal sciences, may represent infringement of professional ethical codes, may be defamatory or infringe on others' legal rights, and it is possible the article could be the subject of a court order. This was actually the editor's opinions after it was reviewed by four reviewers who said things like this, that uh, the manuscript is interesting and it should be published. Then another journal said that, um, well, this is basically the same as a comment hosted in archive, which was removed by the administrators, and uh, we recommend you pursue publication in the journal where the original paper was published in, which is, of course, a great idea, but of course, I had done that long ago. So I sent a comment to Nature in July of last year, which regretfully they couldn't offer to publish it. Another comment on October, which they couldn't offer to publish. And another one in December that they couldn't offer to publish. So there's various channels to do this. And of course, um, well, that's the situation. So let's start from the beginning. So this paper was published in October, 2020, room temperature superconductivity in a carbon ash sulfur hydride, which we call CSH. Um, and as uh, all of you know, I'm sure room temperature superconductivity is a big deal. And um, it was reported for the first time, something that uh, you know, we have been looking for for 100 years, superconductivity at 15 degrees centigrade. And the paper has gotten a lot of attention, 99,000, 8,000 accesses, lots of citations, and so on. So, um, this is what this paper said. They presented evidence for superconductivity from two different types of measurements, resistance and AC magnetic susceptibility. 
resistance drop. So we know if something goes superconducting to zero. And AC magnetic susceptibility, when the material becomes diamagnetic, it, there's a drop in the susceptibility. So this, on the face of it, looks very compelling. I will uh, be concentrating on magnetic susceptibility. And in this regard, it is important that in the figure caption of this figure, it says that the measurement, that what is shown here is data that have been a background signal determined from a non-superconducting sample at 108 GPA has been subtracted from the data. All right, and that will become very important later on. But let me start very briefly saying a word about resistance in magnetic field. That is where we first uh, pointed out together with my colleague, Frank Marsiglio, that there is a real strangeness in this, that these data are very, very sharp drop. And as a function of magnetic field, these are the values of the magnetic field here, it remains equally sharp. And in other superconductors we know about, like magnesium diboride, or let's say high TC cuprate, as you apply a magnetic field, the um, resistance broadens because that's the general property as we understand it of type two superconductors. So anyway, we, we discussed this and um, we came to the conclusion that this probably signals that these, um, so if you plot the, the width of the transition versus field, there's a qualitative difference between the, the CSH and what other superconductors do. And this is, um, I think, indicating that these drops may be due to a metal insulator transition and not to superconductivity. So we said, suggest phenomena probably not associated with superconductivity. So that's the resistance. So now let's go to the susceptibility. So these are the curves that the paper showed on magnetic susceptibility. And uh, there was an inset in a figure that is labeled as, um, Sorry, let me try to do something here. That is labeled as raw data, and the other ones are data. So the difference between data and raw data is the background subtraction. Um, and um, I looked at this and I immediately thought, this is kind of very weird that the raw data would show a drop and then very steep rise right below the drop because that is not what is expected from a superconductor. So these are the raw data. Then you subtract the background signal to get the data which look like this. So this suggests the background is taking off very rapidly at the temperature around the point where we're being shown the raw data, which is kind of unusual. Even if the background does this for this particular temperature, it wouldn't do it for any of the other temperatures. So why show raw data that are so peculiar? So this made me kind of worry about these results. And then, and sorry, because the typical behavior is not like this at all. It's more like the raw data are kind of sloped in some way below and above a drop in the same way. So there is no sharp change in the slope when you, and then when you subtract the, the background, you get something that looks sharper. That's the typical behavior in these experiments. The other thing that uh, uh, came to my attention is that there was a paper in 2009 on European metal becoming superconducting. And there was an inset there of raw data that looked qualitatively very similar to the raw data here in CSH. And so this suggests then that there is also background taking off here. Now, of course, the temperature range is very low here. And at these low temperatures, this is not impossible that there is some divergence in the background due to a Curie law susceptibility. But for the CSH, where this is happening at 150 Kelvin, this really is very strange. And so I found this similarity very peculiar in for very different materials and temperature ranges. So let me give you a timeline. Um, so in order to understand this, I requested the raw data for the susceptibility from the group that had published the paper in Nature. And I also uh, asked the Nature editor to ask them to supply the raw data. This is what they responded back then that, and this is the first where lawyers come into the story that the request for raw data was discussed with counsel and uh, apparently 
Council were told that the raw data may contain patentable inventions for which patent applications have not been updated. And so they could not anticipate when we would they would be able to supply raw data. So then I went and said, okay, let me at least see the raw data for Europium and see if I can understand something from there, November 14. Uh, and then um, I also wrote a comment on the European paper um, questioning this data and send it to PRL. The response of PRL was that this was not appropriate because the letter is 11 years old and I uh, cannot base a comment on a letter on something that happened 11 years later. So in view of that, I decided to write a separate paper on the similarity of the susceptibility for CSH and Europium, which is this paper that I posted in December of 2020, um, where in, it was published online in Physica C. And uh, I said that the similarity between the and this anomalous behavior cast serious doubt on the validity of the results for Europium as well as for the hydro. So at that time, of course, I, I was hoping to publish this as a common PRL to get a response from the authors, but I couldn't, so I published it this way. And um, just calling attention to the similarity of those curves. And of course, the other fact that is relevant about this that we should know is that in the CSH paper and in the uh, European paper, there is one author in common, which is Matthew Debesai. And uh, so in the paper I published, I said, first of all, in the CSH paper, there's essentially no information on the AC susceptibility measurements. Instead, the paper refers the reader to reference 16, which is a paper in 2008. And then I said, this suggests that uh, the measurements were performed using the same experimental apparatus and the same procedure. And so then um, I hypothesized that there could be two reasons for this. Either it's an experimental artifact that happened in both experiments due to some property of the measuring apparatus and doesn't reflect the measurement the properties of the sample or perhaps it's an indication that there is another phase transition. In fact, I had been working on the possibility of magnetism in hydrogen under pressure. So I thought maybe this is an indication of magnetism, not superconductivity. So I suggested these two possibilities in the paper, but um, more than anything, I wanted to hear from the authors. So between December and March, I emailed the authors of the European paper and the CSH paper asking for what could they tell me about this data? Why they look similar? Why they look so unusual? I didn't get any answers. So given that uh, in May, I contacted the National Science Foundation and asked them if they could ask the authors since it's work funded by the National Science Foundation to, um, to supply the raw data behind the CSH measurements. And in June, I contacted Nature Editor-in-Chief um, to see if they could um, again ask the CSH authors. In July, I contacted again the European authors asking for raw data. And then finally, in July 16, the, I did receive the raw data on the European measurements from the authors. And uh, they were like a lot of files with a lot of numbers. And uh, then uh, of course I told the authors, I would like the raw data to look at them and study them. And so I studied the data and in a few days I found that there was data alteration in these measurements. And in fact, I was in conversations with some of the co-authors in that paper that were examining the raw data at the same time. And they also found that there was data alteration in that paper. And so um, I thought that paper would be retracted, but that wasn't happening. So the authors, um, well, so then uh, I told the authors I would communicate with PRL myself and I did so on August 23rd and I contacted PRL and I wrote to PRL and told them that my analysis of those data indicates to me that substantial alteration manipulation of the measured data occurred and that the published data do not faithfully represent what was measured. And the editor of PRL responded that uh, 
the authors had been in touch with PRL and that informed that they were planning to take additional data in order to test the validity of the main result. And it wasn't clear to the editor if or when there would be a correction or a retraction. And I thought uh, that if the data were altered and not representing the measurements, whether or not the European is superconducting or not is not relevant. Um, but my direct communications to the authors uh, did not get a response at this point. And so um, at that point, I wrote a preprint, sorry, a paper that I submitted to archive with this provocative title on the AC magnetic susceptibility of a room temperature superconductor, anatomy of a private scientific fraud. And when archive received it, they put it on hold, not surprisingly. And that makes a lot of sense that somebody, uh, that they didn't know what I was talking about, they would put on a hold. Now the paper I submitted to Physica C also, and Physica C refereed it and the editor approved it and they posted it online on September 26. And uh, so then archive on, they posted it in archive. So after two months of archive moderation, it was posted. So it was approved that it met archive moderation standards. All right, let me tell you just a little bit about what is the problem with the Europium um, data. For example, these are the published raw data that I showed before, but these are what was measured. They are twice, the, the jump is twice as big. And then there is a shift in the temperature in order to get what was measured to reproduce what was published. And the magnitude of the jump is crucial. It's important because it's proportional to the volume of the sample and to the susceptibility of the sample. And then for all the other data that in the published paper look like this, in the when you take the raw data and subtract the background and you plot it, they look like this. So there is clearly a big difference between published and measured data. And um, as I say, the, sometimes there are two jumps here and the magnitude is significant. So this immediately suggests that these jumps may be spurious and not due to superconductivity. If you look at the left diagram, it's very consistent with superconductivity. If you look at the right diagram, it's not. And then there were other anomalies in the raw data, um, in particular, turned out that in order to go from the measured data to the published data, you had to do a transformation, um, a linear transformation that certainly is not described anywhere, nor warranted by what one does here. And I should say, uh, my understanding of this was helped by communications with co-authors of the European paper. And so, and then another thing that it turns out as if you look at the fine structure of the published curves at two different temperature ranges. Well, first of all, you need to apply this linear correction and then you get, for example, these oscillations. And when you look at these two different temperature ranges and you move the measure the data from here to there, they fall right on top of each other. And so basically this is impossible if this is a measurement at two different temperatures. And in fact, you can see that in the published paper, you don't have to get the raw data, but you need to know how to, where to look. If you look at the, at, the, at, the, at the squares here that I highlighted and you put it in your computer and you enlarge it by a factor of 664, 6,400%, you see that the fine structure in these two different temperature regimes is exactly the same, which says that these were not measured data, but they were transferred from one place to another. All right, so um, nothing happened after that. And so I thought that given the situation, the paper should not be in the literature. So November 6, I contacted the editor in chief of the APS about this paper. And then finally on December 23rd, the European paper was retracted. And I would like to point out that this was a long process. 
start uh, took over a year and uh, so the paper was retracted with the text saying at least in partly that the susceptibility data presented in figure two were not accurately reported all right so but the main topic is not europium so let's go back to here and uh, so i still wasn't uh, learning on a previous this. slide uh, what was the reason they gave for for the uh, what there was an explanation from the authors uh the explanation for here yeah what was the yeah well okay so the one reason for the retraction was the susceptibility data presented in figure two were not accurately reported and then another reason for oh they were saying that the that there was a subtle experimental artifact in the freezing of helium and uh, uh, they did more measurements and decided that um, there is no evidence of superconductivity okay so the retraction involves two different things one is confirming that the data that were published were not well it's a euphemistic way to say that they were not representing what was measured Okay. All right. So let me go on. Um, so I did inform the Nature editor that the European paper has problems given the connection with the CSH paper. In July, also, I had asked NSF to help to get the CSH raw data. NSF told me that uh, CSH data can be kept secret. The reason being that, according to Article 42 of the NSF specific requirements for whatever, Section B of the same allows exceptions to accommodate legitimate interests of investigators. And uh, the PI had declared interest, intent to share the data once the associated pending patents are finalized and approved. So, okay, again, this, and now, and I should say that uh, I go back to NSF saying, well, there's no way that releasing these raw data can affect any patent or any um, other interests and so i try to tell nsf consult with experts and see if any experts will say that there is a reason to um, that there's a legitimate interest but i could not get any response from nsf and uh, so finally in August, 30th of August, uh, that is nine months after the paper was published for the first time, Nature published an editor's note saying that they have been alerted to undeclared access restrictions related to the data and that they are working with the authors to correct the data availability statement. So that is something that they had known since December of 2020 when I told them that uh, I really would like to see those data. And by the way, it's uh, certainly part of the commitment of an author that submits to nature. It's printed in the same paper. The data supporting the findings of the study are available um, and in the supplementary material and from the corresponding author upon reasonable request, which of course they were not here. And that's why nature publishes notes saying that they would work to correct the data availability state. So then in uh, October, there was this uh, uh, article in Science News that I mentioned in my abstract. And that came about. And so this article says what, uh, you know, my request for the underlying data had been rebuffed by the authors for nearly a year. And it uh, quotes my paper on Physica C that I mentioned before. And I just would like to say a few things about the paper in Physica C. So there I explain. So the main reason why I wrote this paper and put this provocative title is basically because of the fact that the authors were not releasing the raw data. And I said, well, in this paper, I will explain why the published data on the susceptibility the strongest suggests that either the interpretation of the published result is wrong or there were experimental errors and or there was manipulation of data. And I did cite in the paper and discuss the evidence that the results for the susceptibility of europium are established now to be fraudulent. And by that I meant 
that the fact that data were copied from one part to another part and transformations were made uh, means that there was manipulation of data. And I also said in the paper, it would be easy for the authors of the CSH paper to establish that the published CTV results are valid and real by providing the raw data for examination. And again, my main motivation for writing this paper, which some may call inflammatory, is, was because I really thought I had no evidence on the CSH data other than you know, some worries about the, the graphs that I told you about. And so I really wanted to see the raw data. So anyway, in the same science uh, article in October, uh, they do mention the European situation and that the authors of the European paper acknowledge that there are alterations to the data. So um, what was uh, in the same paper, uh, Ranga Diaz was asked for his view of things and he said that I am a troll and they wouldn't feed me by providing the data. And uh, they also said that they don't trust me to appraise the data fairly. Um, the next thing that happened a month later was that the Physica C paper was temporarily removed from the journal website. And uh, the reason was that uh, I had in a, inadvertently and inappropriately revealed the content of private communications uh, related to the issue of the what I just said, the data alteration communication from other authors, and that I had analyzed those raw data in, the, in my paper in Physica C. So the paper was temporarily removed from Physica C on those grounds. Uh, and in this same article in Science News, um, the authors of the CSH paper continue to say that my accusations are pathetic and that they have shared their data with scientists they trust, but I guess I didn't, uh, I wasn't included in that group. So this was in November. Um, anyway, perhaps because of all this controversy, finally on December 1, the, and perhaps because of the intervention of some people, I was told that, uh, in fact, in the same science paper, some people urge he has to release the data and privately I was told by some other people that they had urged he has to release the data. December 1, uh, some of the raw data were released and December 28, uh, other uh, more of the raw data were released. And those were released in this paper in archive titled Standard Superconductivity in Carbonaceous Sulfur Hydride, where it is a table, uh, they say, Manuscript aims to respond to this concern by providing raw data. So for whatever reason, I think this is positive. It took a long time, but the raw data were released. So these are tables from the archive paper that I just showed you that have the raw data and the data for each of the pressures that uh, were measured. And so there is a background signal that uh, can be obtained by doing raw data minus data. The archive paper didn't provide the background signal, but of course we just simply calculated by doing a difference of the two columns that are given in those tables. And let's remember that the original paper said the background signal was measured at a lower pressure and that was what was subtracted from the data. And so I analyzed those data um, as they were released and I published, uh, I wrote papers on that, which I was able to publish them at this um, preprint server, not archive. Um, for example, uh, it's called preprints.org. First one, disconnect between published AC magnetic susceptibility and measure raw data. So what I do there, I, I analyze the raw data and the data and I discuss what are the implications for the claim that the material is a room temperature superconductor. N none of these papers talks about fraud or anything like that. I mean, it analy they analyze the information. This one is called incompatibility of published AC magnetic susceptibility. 
This one I actually sent, it's a short paper I sent to Nature. It's one of the papers that Nature, um, one of the comments that Nature said they couldn't publish it. This one, uh, after the second release of data with further analysis, this was actually withdrawn from this preprint server for reasons I still haven't understood. I think it has to do with the complaint that uh, somebody did about this, but they are all accessible through my web page and you can read any of them. Um, those papers never appear in archive. They were blocked and subsequently deleted by archive. Uh, then, in, so the first they were put on hold and then they were deleted. On January 20th, Dirk van der Marel and I, uh, well, Dirk su submitted the paper. And so I'll talk more about Dirk's role in this in a minute. And since Dirk submitted it, it was approved by archive and it was posted, but then uh, 10 days later, it was removed by archive due to inflammatory content and unprofessional language. So before I go on with the story, let me tell you something about these data and raw data that were released. So here is the, um, these are the published curves. These are the data from the tables that were released in the archive paper. So here I'm showing the, the curves that are published in the paper. And so these are expanded versions that we can plot because now we have the numbers. You will notice that for 138 GPA, these are data, not raw data. And these are what the original paper said were raw data. So that's a confusion that I still don't understand the relevance, but I don't want you to be confused. So I'm just clarifying this point in any event. So these are the data and then the raw data. So these were labeled raw data in the published paper, but they are actually data. The raw data before you subtract the background are shown for the six pressures over here. So you see, for example, there is a slope here that makes sense. And then when you subtract the background, you get something sharper. So these are the published curves. These are the raw data. And so when you look at the raw data, you say, well, yeah, there is evidence that there is a drop in susceptibility. And so they could have just published the raw data then rather than subtracting a background. And we would have been happy too to see there is evidence of superconductivity. The 138 are very anomalous. As I say, the data are what was called raw data and the raw data look like this. And as you can see, there is a qualitative difference. There are two different slopes below and above the drop and who knows what that means. But anyway, so this looks okay. Uh, but then the first thing we would like to know is, okay, what does the background look like? So we do raw data minus data to get what the background signal looks like. And it looks like this. And uh, so this is for the different temperature ranges and different uh, pressures where the data were shown. So the background was supposedly measured at the 108 GPA. So we can try to put all this together, but there is a shift involved in the, um, plots because everything is normalized to show that the susceptibility is zero above the jump. So we have to guess a shift in order to make this plot that I'm going to show you now. And I try to guess the shift so that the background curve would look as smooth as possible. And this is what you get. And so what you can see here is, for example, it's no way that this could have been a single background measurement over the entire temperature range at the 108 GPA as was reported because this is a double valued function in this temperature range. And also there is these strange changes in slope in the different temperature ranges. So this looks kind of inconsistent with this statement in the paper. Um, so uh, going into more detail. So this is one example of the data, which is published data is a green curve for 166 GPA. The raw data is a black uh, curve and the background obtained by subtraction is a red curve. What you can see is that the oscillations in the raw data and the background, they track each other. And so here is a comparison below the jump where I have shifted this to see how it compares. So in the next slide, I actually shifted the entire curve to make it a little clearer. So I just shifted this background curve down 
So as to see that the, the oscillations both below and above the jump are the same in the raw data and in the background. And so when you subtract, you get the data. So the background has the same noise as the raw data and that, that noise is much larger than the noise in the data itself, which is not consistent with the background being an independent measurement that was uh, subtracted from the raw data in order to get the data. Uh, I checked that by looking at many other measurements in other materials that uh, when you do measurements at different pressures, the noise that you get is different. There's never the same noise for two different curves. So it makes no sense to assume that measuring at 108 GPA and 166 GPA will give exactly the same oscillations in two different measurements. So here again, the um, raw data and the background for now the six different pressures. You will notice again that there is a qualitative difference in 138 GPA uh, the, uh, measurements, which I don't know what is the relevance, but this noise coincidence you can see in all the measurements. Then I did another analysis, which is to look at the first derivative for the increment in susceptibility and compare that between data and raw data. And what I found is that the, this delta chi for the raw data, which are the black points, has a much broader range than for the data, which are the green points, which is really strange because uh, that shouldn't happen, that the increment should be the same or larger for the data than for the raw data. Because the data are the difference between two different signals that both of them have, uh, the raw data and background signal, they both would have noise. In particularly for 160 GPA, these look extremely strange because the data show no scatter at all. They show these separated lines, which is, very strange. So I looked at this in more detail. And so again, here we show the delta chi, the difference in the neighboring points for the raw data are in black and for the background signal are in red. You subtract this and you get this, which was green in the previous slide. You get these lines that look perfectly smooth without any noise. And then I also plotted the data themselves for a small temperature range the data are the blue points here, and the raw data are the oscillating points here. And you can see the very strange structure in the data where they are continuous lines and then they are separated by jumps. While the raw data show these oscillations that are apparently consistent with what you would expect. So I found this very strange. So in this paper that Archive didn't post, I wrote that the highly regular data for 160 GPA shown for a limited temperature range in figure nine could not have resulted from a physical measurement nor from a combination of physical measurements. And uh, I couldn't post this in archive, but I did post it in this preprint.org and uh, they offered me to send preprints to 10 people when I posted it. And so I sent it to 10 people. I don't remember who they were, but one of them was Dirk van der Marl. And so uh, sometime later, Dirk wrote to me with a question, which was um, the blue squares in this figure nine look like a perfectly smooth inverted parabola to which n times 0.15 was added, where n is an integer number. It won't be very complicated to undo those shifts and check whether this is numerically generated polynomial. Well, it was brilliant inside that hadn't occurred to me. And I'm really glad that um, it happened that Dirk got this paper and looked at it. And so indeed, so here is again that same plot and this is for a different part of the same plot. When you shift by this quantity 0.16555 times n where n is an integer, you can connect all these points and they form a very, very smooth curve. And so then we did a more uh, detailed analysis of the entire set of data and uh, over the entire temperature range. And so here's split up in the two separate ranges below and above the transition temperature. 
And so when you shift these by these integers, then you get these continuous curves, which we call the unwrapped data. So here it's for the lower and the higher temperature range, and this is um, for the um, entire temperature range. And they are perfectly smooth. And so uh, in January 20, then we posted this paper saying that uh, we provide an analysis of this data and we said, oh my God, that the published data have been manipulated, we thought, because of this analysis. Um, big mistake. So archive removed the paper because of the single sentence that uh, they call inflammatory, well, or maybe more, who knows, inflammatory content and unprofessional language. So anyway, the conclusions of this is that the superconducting signal is a quantized component plus the unwrapped curve. The quantized component looks like this, and it just steps of this 0.16555 times an integer, and the unwrapped curve is this continuous curve that we see here. So just to summarize, uh, this the 160 GPA curve that was published here, you enlarge it, you look at this region, you amplify it, it has these very strange steps. And as I say, they are supposed a difference between raw data and background. And so this makes no sense. So there's a complete disconnect between raw data and data. And um, so this is now for the two, the lower and the upper temperature regions. All right. So, um, what happened next is that uh, the author, two of the authors of the CSH paper post a response to this comment that we have posted with Dirk, where they said that um, basically we had misunderstood their paper and they aim to provide an understanding of the incorrect analysis of our work and the, why it's a misinterpretation. So, um, and they explain here what they did. Uh, well, they tried to explain what they did. We use a temperature dependence of the measured voltage above and below the TC of each pressure measurement and scale to determine a user-defined background. Um, the scaling is such that one achieves an approximately zero signal above a transition. So, and they call this user-defined background method one. So this is the entire explanation. We don't know exactly what this means. With UDB1, uh, well, they say this procedure is either not understood or intentionally ignored by us. So in other words, the background is not an independently measured signal as Hirsch and Van der Mar incorrectly claim. Now, of course, it's not that we incorrectly claim, it's what the published paper said, that it was an independent measure. Anyway, so in this archive paper that was published uh, at the end of January, they show their own background. Raw data are the red and the UDB1, which they say they construct, but we, I can't understand how they construct it, is the blue line. And as you can see, just as I showed earlier, uh, the background and the Raw data have exactly the same noise, which at least you can see partly here uh, from, from their own published paper. And here is amplified and you see it again. So um, the noise, so this UDB1 is constructed in some unknown way so that it tracks the measured data, but at the same time it tracks it in such a way that when you subtract the measured data, and the background, the raw data and the background, you get the green curve, which has these steps that I had described earlier. Anyway, so um, we have now two different statements. One is that the data are the raw data minus the background signal. And then we have our analysis that says that the superconducting signal is a quantized component and the unwrapped curve that was a continuous curve. So we can obviously ask, is it possible that the quantized component is um, the measured voltage and that the unwrapped curve that we found was continuous is somehow a smoothened approximation to the background signal that was measured? 
And the answer is no, because we have the data and the raw data supplied by the authors. And if we make a comparison, the measured voltage, the raw data that the authors say they measured is this, but this quantized component that we did use from their data is different. And for the background is qualitatively different. The unwrapped curve that we did use is this curve and the background that follows from the tables is this. So this would not explain, I mean, uh, we had a suggestion um, that uh, perhaps the measure voltage was quantized because of a property of a measuring apparatus. And that's what we were finding. But as you can see, what was reported as measure voltage is not quantized. And in fact, the resolution is much, much larger than these steps that we found are part of the uh, data. And the other thing that we found is that this unwrapped curve is in fact a combination of third degree polynomials. It's 14 third degree polynomials. If you look at the derivatives of this, you find that the second derivative, you have these linear pieces which uh, tell you that this is just a combination of 14 different third degree polynomials. We can get the coefficients of those polynomials. And it turns out that's a cubic spline that you obtain when you put 14 uh, points like shown here and you ask the computer to just join them with a cubic sign, you get exactly the same behavior as this unwrapped curve um, shows. All right, so, um, as I say, this is a situation with this data. And so what's the story on this? We were told that these are data in the nature paper are raw data minus background. We were told that the background is measured at 108 GPA. After 14 months of delaying, the authors released the data and the raw data. The examination of the data and raw data reveals that it is impossible that the published data were obtained from subtracting measured data and any background signal. So the published acceptability data are not evidence for superconductivity, I think, because they are not supported by valid underlying data. How the data resulted from the raw data is still a mystery. I hypothesized back in December um, that it looks like because of this noise difference that um, we should rewrite this equation as follows, data plus background signal equals raw data, that it means that the physical reasonable approximate linear background signal, and we add those to the published data, that will give rise to what is called raw data. But of course, it would be a misnomer to call such numbers obtained from doing this addition and getting that raw data. And in the very detailed analysis we did now with Dirk van der Marer, we have a lot more evidence that at least the only way we can understand the what is reported as measured voltage is that it is a superposition of two things on the right side that give what's called measured voltage. Anyway, so at this point, Nature hasn't done much. They have published on the 15th of February a note saying that there is concerns regarding the manner in which the data have been processed and that they are working with the authors to investigate these concerns. Now, I'd like to tell you more about the archive story. And I told you already some facts that I think are very important to me. So on the 24th of August, I sent this paper on the AC magnetic susceptibility because I, could, I wasn't being successful in getting the raw data. And archive posted my paper on in October and they never complained to me that this was unprofessional or inflammatory or anything. So archive moderation, the only thing they did over this two month period is to change from being a paper that is submitted to condensed matter to being a paper that was published in physics society and whatever this other domain is that they have. And so what happened then on the 9th of November and December is that archive removed that paper, not based on any language, based on the fact that it had been removed from the journal due to these other reasons I told you, so archive also withdrew it. But then on the 9th of November, I got an email from the chair of archive telling me that um, I was doing things wrong, that um, 
um, the reason they were holding my submissions is because my language is unprofessional and in violation of the code of conduct. I regularly use personal attacks, accusation of fraud, and use unnecessary derogatory and demeaning language. And then in February 7th, I was informed that because I did submit other papers since December 9, my archive submission privileges have been suspended for six months, which is the current status. I would like to point out that uh, all these five papers that were published since December, you can look at each one of them uh, that were submitted to archive. There is no language that says anything about fraud, they simply analyzes data, paper one, paper two, paper three, and so on. Paper five, for example, is a reply to the latest comment by Snyder as simply asking the process by which the numbers are obtained is not explained, and we hope the authors will update their posting. Well, archive doesn't allow any of this discussion, but they suspended me um, for these things. So then uh, there was this paper that I mentioned in my abstract that um, talks about this controversy, and um, in particular, Francis Hellman, the chair, uh, president of the American Physical Society, mentions uh, correctly that archive is a tremendous value to the physics community, and indeed this, I look at it every day, and to me, it's extremely important for me to be able to put my papers there and to me to be able to read other people's papers there. And so uh, Hellman says that the superconductor controversy may stem in part from the ethos of physics, that physics is not very welcoming, and uh, that the problem is the language. And as you can gather from what I've been saying, I don't think that's a problem. Now, the same, uh, for example, archive people, Paul Fendley in this says that moderation helps ensure papers don't include invective about, uh, against other scientists. So, and there was an email interchange in particular with Paul Fendley. And so where he asked the questions, do you think it is appropriate to have an archived paper with a title containing an anatomy of a parallel scientific fraud? If you think such a title is not inflammatory, what would be? Well, I just would like to repeat, archive posted the paper, archive never asked me to change the language of that paper. They posted it after two months of consideration by moderation and none of the five papers that were blocked and then deleted since December said anything about scientific fraud nor had anything inflammatory language. Uh, archive has a long-standing policy of not allowing personal invective. Is archive censoring people by not allowing them personal invective? Well, there was no personal invective in any of the papers. What there was was pointing out that there was one author in common to two papers that showed similar uh, behavior. So what's going on with archive? Why are they doing this when it looks inconsistent with the facts? They do not give explanations. They never told me on those five papers that were the basis for my suspensions, what in those five papers triggered the suspension. They never did. Well, I had written a letter to Physics World that was published in December and the archive management team had answered that later. I was talking in general about archives uh, moderation policy, not in regard with this controversy, in regard with the policy to put papers on hold when they are kind of controversial, perhaps. And uh, the response of archive management team there said this in particular, particularly problematic are submissions that contain accusations of fraud and misconduct directed at specific people as they expose archive to legal challenges from those accused. And I think that is exactly what's behind what's going on with archive, that there have been letters, and I know for a fact of several such letters from authors, cease and desist letters, that if somebody allows me to continue to publish false accusations, then there will be legal consequences. And so uh, I have no doubt, although nobody at archive has confirmed that to me, but 
it's very clear that this is behind the sudden change in attitude of archive when they first posted the paper in October and then in December they accused me of doing bad things. So I think that's a real reason for archive censorship is this legal aspect and in my web page I put a long detailed explanation which you are welcome to look at for why I think that is it but I won't bore you with that now. So uh, I think that archive is misleading in the way that they are saying one thing and doing something else. It blocks scientific discussion of evidence of scientific fraud when and only when it is threatened with lawsuits. And uh, it says there is a process to appeal moderation decision, but there isn't one because they actions are governed by things that they do not disclose. If they had told me on day one, look, we have been threatened with a lawsuit. Can you make sure that your articles are not uh, in any way accusatory? I would have complied. I would have changed language. I would have done my best to just put a very dry analysis, but that's not what they did. And uh, so here's what I said in this thing I wrote or that, I mean, the problem here is archive we know runs on a shoestring budget. They don't want to face lawsuits, that's fine. So there should be maybe some way that if somebody, I mean, these are threats, these are not real. There's no basis, I think, for the fear that on uh, analysis of data that shows that there is manipulation of data, somebody can be sued for that. And so I would hope that this is not what governs uh, the actions of archive. And uh, anyway, so this is some of the things I say about broader impacts of what I think this experience has um, shown that, um, you know, there is a real damage, I think, to not having an easier way for, to enforce that, uh, that, that authors are really bound to disclose the underlying data of their measurements and i think that is a problem and if federal agencies like nsf do not enforce it and if journals do not enforce the policies that they have on paper that authors should release the raw data then there is a lot of damage done to the scientific enterprise and um, that um, what is really the problem is not the ethos of physics or the or the language or the welcoming i think the problem is that there should be more of an action to make sure that uh, any questioning of uh, data i mean if it's an honest questioning and it requires releasing the raw data that that's that's done uh, immediately so i would like to thank you for your attention and uh, would like hopefully to get questions